back to my channel. Hi everybody, how are you doing? I hope everyone there out there is having a wonderful day. Um, I had a very uneventful day. As you can see, it's beginning around 9 p.m., 10 p.m. I just stayed in and took care of some filing that I had to do. And um, basically, I'm very tired. I, I don't know what it is. I'm sleepy tired, you know what I mean? And I haven't been walking much, that's for sure. Um, but the weather is beginning to look up and it's hopefully starting to look like the spring I've been waiting for and not the tail end of the summer I wasn't expecting. <laughs> so um, what I wanted to uh, go over was my new skincare creams, my products that are from the same line that I normally do use. They're from L'Oreal. This one is for daytime and this one is for nighttime. And they're um, fortified with Manuka honey. And um, I have tried this one. I wore it last night. I still haven't had a chance to try the day cream. But um, actually, without anything at all on my face, no makeup, no cream, nothing, um, there, it's feeling soft. I'm, I'm surprised. And it is quite, um, um, it penetrates very well. And it, it also leaves the top layer of your skin quite, quite moist. And so maybe that's uh, what I really do need, especially for winter time. Watch them take it off the market like they did with my other um, serum lotion. Uh, it's It's been removed from the market. I don't know if it's being upgraded or completely removed. I don't know. Um, however, I should buy now the eye cream that goes with this. Um, so I have a ton of skincare creams sitting on the shelf. I'm using a little of this and a little of that. Um, they look very promising, guys. I, I'm quite pleased with the nighttime cream so far. And um, hopefully this will do the trick for during the day as well. Um, so guys, before I introduce you to my um, next case, I wanted to um, say a few words just on, well, first of all, Julia Wendell and the whole situation itself uh, regarding content on my channel and comments that I am now reporting and blocking. Um, you know, if you have been enabling subtitles and if you have been following my vlogs, you know that I've already claimed I do not know what the situation with Julia's past is. Um, I was trying not to be critical of the parents. Um, however, I did make a statement regarding the uh, refusal to do a DNA test. And I'm really, you know, miffed by the mom's choice not to do that. Still, it was her choice. I mean, I could sit here and criticize the McCanns for doing the same thing, but I'm not going to do that. What I am saying is that uh, I'm very confused by it. And I don't know who to believe regarding the birth certificate situation, whether it was stolen, whether um, Julia's mother was hanging on to it for safekeeping, and refusing to give it to her, whether Julia took it. I don't know. I don't know what the situation is. But if I get any more hateful remarks regarding what I have been trying to figure out, and um, yes, I, I, I did disagree with the mother's choice not to do a DNA test. Uh, now that it's an internationally wide issue, I, I think maybe she might have foregone her personal situation with the family and with Julia, but you know what? I'm probably wrong. Uh, I'm not trying to accuse the mother of doing anything. Like everybody else, I want the truth. And if you try to put words into my mouth 
anymore. I'm going to need to report you daily, hourly, if I have to. Um, I, I don't want any hate out here, whether it's directed at me, at Julia, at the McCanns, at, at the Wendells, I don't care who it is. Um, if you insist on venting your rage out on this channel, um, I will call you out and I will continue to report and block you. So um, anyway, I, I know that it's not going to come to that. So, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to give you one more idea on where I'm headed with this material that I've been trying to put together for Julia Wendell, basically for Julia Wendell's case and to find Madeline McCann, to get to the bottom of what really did happen to Madeline McCann. Because, of course, we know that if it weren't for the disappearance of this child, we wouldn't have all these missing child cases that resemble Maddie physically. And you know what I mean? Whether it's instigated by media or the child herself, um, Maddie will be turning 20 this May, and so she's no longer, well, she's technically on her way to um, adulthood, if she's still alive. And so what I want to do, guys, is give you an entirely different perspective of the Madeline McCann case, and it's something that I haven't wanted to do, but I think because... I, I can continue to become even more objective about this case. I adore the McCanns, and I almost feel as though I have come to love them. I, I think that what they did to protect themselves and their family and their loved ones um, must have been very hard to keep everybody out of the public eye. But I think they took a fall. I think they took a fall, and I think they took a fall to maybe protect another party from being accused. I don't know. I, I think maybe they're valiant, they're heroic. Um, however, Richard Hall is one investigator who he's, he's actually represents a, an entire investigative team that looked into the Maddie McCann evidence and came out with an entirely different different um, scope and perspective of the entire case. And it kind of puts the McCanns in a bad light. And that's why I hung back. I never went to that side. Actually, more has come out that's clarified a few of his points a lot. And because it's the flip side of what I've been trying to say, um, that they, you know, the um, perpetrator is still at large. We don't know where she is. She may be alive. We don't know what happened to her. I, I'm going to give you the flip side, but not yet. I, I need to gather some courage and some momentum because I, I really adore the McCanns. I don't want anything anything to cloud their reputation on my channel. But I need to be upfront about the evidence. And it's more or less a different way of looking at evidence, evidence that we've already looked at. And so put that aside and keep that in the back of your minds and uh, on the shelf somewhere back there uh, for a future a uh, couple of episodes or more, and um, it's coming, guys. I'm working on it. It's coming, and I hope that I can represent it in as clear and concise a matter, uh, uh, a way that um, Richard Hall did in his four-hour documentary, which um, I will not link yet uh, because I first want to, you know, get a chance to gather some notes and uh, focus on the major points that have been so 
um, ambiguous and, and troubling for so many of us looking at this case. And so guys, um, now I will introduce you to the case of little nine-year-old Cecilia Zhang, who went missing in 2006 for six months. Alright guys, so let's get started on this new case involving little Cecilia Zhang. And I believe I made a mistake. I made an error in claiming that she was abducted in 2006. She was act actually um, abducted during a very good year of my life. Uh, a year that I had spent very little time in my city. It was the year that I got married abroad. And I got married in September, on September the 16th of 2003, in another country. And this incident, uh, I did return to my country on, on September the 16th, the same day. And this incident only happened uh, about um, barely a month later, on October 20th, 2003. And so at, at that time, little Cecilia Zhang was um, nine years old and um, she did vanish in the middle of the night uh, on October 20th, 2003. And um, let's talk a little bit about her parents who were a lovely couple uh, by all means. I don't know all the entire um life history of their situation um, in China and here, but I'm going to try to understand it as best as I can. So um, her parents, Raymond and Sherry, came from Jiangsu, Jiangsu in 1998. And so Cecilia um, was born in 1994 back in the other country. And so uh, at that time that the abduction occurred, um, Cecilia was in grade four. At the, she was attending the Seneca Hill Public School and was enrolled in a gifted program. And now guys, the area and the um, schools that I'm going to be mentioning throughout this um, little series, um, if you can remember, um, the tour that I took you for Tracy's, um, retracing Tracy's steps or, or possible st steps from the bus stop to Cliffwood Plaza. And we made a left-hand turn at that big traffic light. Well, imagine us making a right-hand turn instead and we would be in Cecilia's neighborhood. Yeah, uh, another one. And so, um, she was enrolled in a gifted program, but um, her parents were very, very overprotective and did not even let her play alone without supervision, not even on the front lawn of their home. And so in the early morning hours of October 20th, 2003, little um, Cecilia Zhang, um, she disappeared from her very own bed. And so um, what happened was that after dinner, um, Cecilia and her parents, um, you know, they had sat down to dinner on the evening of October 19th, 2003. And then uh, after dinner, Cecilia went to um, play just a little on the piano. And witnesses from the downstairs lodgings uh, claimed that they um, heard her play um, after dinner. So she was still there and alive then. And so after playing on the piano for a bit, she headed to bed. And now, by now it would be 8, 8.30ish. And so um, Cecilia got ready for bed and Sherry came up and tucked Cecilia into bed. When Sherry went to wake her daughter the next morning for school, at about um, 8 o'clock, 8.30, uh, Cecilia was gone. 
And now Sherry didn't know what to believe because nobody had heard anything, nobody had seen anything. The only unusual occurrence that morning after finding Cecilia gone were two um, phone hangups, later traced by police to a payphone near the ravine. But they couldn't be traced um, any further than that, of course. And so um, nothing ever came of those two phone calls. And so it was immediately suspected that uh, because of those hang-up calls, that there would be a ransom, a future ransom request coming in for little, the return of little Cecilia. There had never been a ransom demand. And guys, the reason for that is because um, little did anybody know, Cecilia was already gone. Um, the female visa student who occupied Cecilia's room six months earlier, um, she was from the same country as the Zangs. And as Christy Blatchford, my very favorite and now dearly departed columnist wrote, in truth, the Zang family was so lovely and um, they rented out rooms to students from their native country. And so uh, they would never have imagined that they would be hurt by one of them, by one of these very people coming across from that country as a student. And so um, the thing is, guys, is because the Zangs were new immigrants and a young family in need of cash, uh, certain, um, certain, certain stories began to circulate, certain rumors and certain activities began to be associated with them. And what it, precisely they were, I'm not sure, because um, the newspapers and the police don't make any mention of them. However, they were there, they were circulating. And the thing is that the Zangs were um, in need of cash, but they were very cautious and they were very careful of the students that they took in as boarders. And so um, it was always a rule that the students would be confined to the lower basement level where there would be no access to the rest of the house where Cecilia and her parents um, resided. So there were rumors and the parents, one of these rumors, um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the rumor was, but it did uh, insinuate that um, Ray and Sherry were doing illegal things down in the basement uh, for further financial gain. And so people began to eventually speculate that greed might have cost them the most important thing in their lives, their only child, their only little girl who was now missing. And so their actions, are uh, everybody, were scrutinized um, by the police, by neighbors, by everyone, by the media since um, since the beginning of their daughter's disappearance, and um, later on, pet the parent the parents would have quickly agreed to a plea bargain to avoid a potentially embarrassing trial. I I don't know what it was all about, but I'm sure it did not indicate that they were deserving of such a, a, a horrific event. And so something was up, something was up. And it does remind me a bit of the McCann ordeal after the disappearance of Madeline. And so, however, um, very quickly, it was the borders that police began to concentrate on right away. They were, um, there were so many of them over the five years too. It wasn't just at that specific time. And so um, uh, over the five years that the Zhang family was living there, um, boarders moved in and out very quickly as students normally do. And so it wasn't ultimately a boarder who was indeed responsible for the disappearance of little Cecilia. It was not. It was um, rather a, a friend of a boarder who had moved out six months 
prior to the incident of the abduction. So um, now uh, the, there was a female visa student living uh, at the home six months prior. And six months prior to the abduction, Min Chen, a male, a 21-year-old male Chinese student, was a frequent visitor at the Zhang home. Well, I wouldn't say maybe frequent, but maybe four times, something like that, because he was friends with the female boarder who lived at the house. And so um, that was that. And so in the end, the parents, you know, after all the investigation was completed and the person responsible was arrested, um, the parents were fully vindicated by police when the real perpetrator was actually caught. And so, um, but it took a lot, guys. It took a lot um, because the, the murderer did not have a criminal record or fingerprints on the police system. You know how it is. And so Sherry and Ray were naturally so very, very devastated with grief and worry and, and anxiety, uh, while Zhang, Ray Zhang, blamed himself for the very usual things that any parent feels in such a situation. And um, the prosecution ultimately, you know, at the trial said that there was nothing that this family did to invite such horror not even if they indeed were in trouble with the law. Um, and they could have done very, very little to prevent it. So this is why, guys, and this is where I'm going to stop. This is why the brutality of the police force or the investigator um, dealing with the Zams it seems to me so out of place and so unacceptable. And yes, I have to admit, it. it to me, even though many people admit that this was good police work, um, you know, tracking down the borders, looking for evidence, uh, this is not anything to write home about. It's not proud. It's nothing to be proud of. And I will leave it for the next second part because it, to me, it, it really just screams racism and I'm sorry, that's how I see it. They could have been more sensitive. And I, I think in the end, they, they felt bad, but I don't know how much they did to rectify it. The, the abusive treatment of the poor mother, which I will get into um, in a moment, in, not in a moment, next time. So guys, um, thank you so much for watching me and listening to me and my as I go along my dull tasks. It was a very uneventful day, but um, I will be going on with the case in a day or so. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe I will. And so um, please uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will be talking to you very soon. Bye for now.